voice speaks as in the beginning Turning dark to light again I was Deacon discernment class. This is a, a video that's kind of a truncated form of the information in the class. It's designed uh, for those of you who missed the class or for anybody who wants kind of a refresher on what happened in the class. Uh, so this class is kind of the place where the, the rubber hits the road as far as discernment goes um, for, <coughs> for deacons or for church leadership. Uh, when you think about what it is, um, it, what you desire from learning discernment, there, there are two main things that come to mind. The, uh, the first is kind of the sense of an affirmation of one's relation with God, kind of the sense of knowing who we are, the kind of knowing who God has made us to be, knowing um, who we are even in the sense of knowing our, our brokenness, our woundedness, and the places that God brings healing and that God brings acceptance and peace, purpose and calling. Um, it also kind of uh, includes knowing who God is to us. The second side of discernment, this is probably the side we think of more often when we think of discernment, is decision making. It's, it's asking God to give us an idea of which way we should turn in a particular place or what, <laughs> what our purpose or vision in life should be. Uh, but what I want you to know at the very outset of this, this conversation is that these two things are rarely, di are rarely divided. It's not something where we seek God's discernment on direction apart from knowing who we are in Him. It's, in fact, in some ways, discernment is probably 95% um, connecting with God or affirmation of who we are with God. Um, and frankly, the, the idea of God giving us direction and discernment of, of vision in life or purpose in life usually flows from our knowing who we are in Him. Uh, up until this point in this class, we've been talking predominantly about knowing who we are in God. A lot of the, the, dis, the um, discernment practices we've put together have been designed in order to allow us to hear God speak to, into our lives about um, who He knows us to be, or, so that we can begin to discover who we are in Him. Uh, this class is largely going to be about um, the second thing. It's going to be about uh, discernment of direction, discernment guidance in, in the path that we're taking or, or for vision. Uh, let me read you a text from Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21. Uh, the text says, The human mind may devise many plans, but it, it is the purpose of the Lord that will be established. And there are very many texts like that. Uh, but the general idea of this text is that, that, that God does have an opinion on the paths we're going and that that opinion actually matters much. And we also get a sense from this verse that, that we don't always know what God's opinion is. We're not always sure. Uh, and it seems like uh, knowing God's opinion would be helpful. And helpful kind of figure out what would be less hassle in life. It would be a little easier if we should know if we should marry this person, we should move into this house, we should move into this career, if God would kind of tell us what his opinion on things are. In many ways, that's what discernment is about. Uh, discernment kind of steps in as a, kind of a theoretical bridge that, that connects us to God's opinion, God's will, God's plan for, for our lives. Um, and the truth is that there are times where this is there's easy to tell and there's times where it's not so easy to tell. And it's exactly in that kind of place of gray uh, that the danger of discernment happens. You, you see, uh, discernment can become dangerous when we kind of become frozen. We become frozen in the midst of a decision-making experience where we, we want to know what God wants us to do. We want to do what God wants us to do, but we're kind of frozen because we don't know. We can't hear God in a particular moment. And maybe the danger gets even worse if we, if we make a decision in life. Maybe it's a good faith decision. Maybe it's a decision because we don't know what God has been saying. And now we're, we're looking back and we're wondering, am I doing the thing that God wanted me to do? And we end up living in a place of uh, shame and fear and uh, even guilt for the place we are. There's an author named Gary Friesen who, who writes this. He writes, Many Christians fear they have missed God's individual or specific will. In the absence of clear leading, they went ahead and made a choice, and now they feel guilty because they aren't certain that they have done what God wants. The truth is that, that a lot of Christians kind of risk this. They, they think in terms of, I don't know what God wants me to do because, well, I'm not a good enough Christian. I haven't been faithful enough. And because I haven't been faithful enough, it kind of spirals in a place of, of kind of shame and guilt and feeling like they need to be doing more. Uh, and Friesen kind of, his solution to this whole idea is, is to basically conclude that God doesn't really have a specific will for people. Uh, and so we shouldn't be looking for that specific will. Instead, what God does is God gives us wisdom and, and discernment in our present present uh, circumstances to make the best decision that we can. He, he kind of emphasizes this idea of free. I, I like a lot of what Friesen has to say, this author has to say, but sometimes he, he kind of throws the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, I think there's a lot to learn. So, so let me give you kind of an alternate way of, of looking at this idea of how we discern God's will. There's an author named um, Larry Warner who, who gives us um, 
kind of a wider sense of things, a sense that there are time specific directions or a very specific sense of where we should go, guidance in, in our will. And there's other times where, where he doesn't tend to let us make decisions on our own, kind of give us a place where we move in freedom in relationship with him. And so he talks about this as being two alternating metaphor being that of, of a meadow. Let, let me read you what he says about that. He says, God's will as a meadow speaks to a freedom to live one's life but it's not a freedom of autonomy. It is a freedom born out of and maintained through relationship with the Good Shepherd, a life lived listening to and willing to do shepherd. Now, there's a sense that, that ultimately we are in relationship with God, even when we're at a place where he's not giving us a direct sense of, of where we should be going um, in relationship to his will, if he's not telling us to turn left or to turn right. Uh, but nevertheless, we are in this kind of a meadow, meadow bounded by God's will, bounded by God's word. So there's definitely places we, <coughs> we shouldn't go and we know we shouldn't go according to God's will. But at the same time, within that meadow, we are given the opportunity to, to, to play, to to live, to make decisions, to, to live in freedom. And there's a, it's a living God allows us freedom to make choices, gives us authority, allows us to be kind of agents with free will. Uh, God doesn't, that doesn't impose himself upon us, but rather invites us to kind of live with him. And, and here's the, the space, I think, that the 95% the of discernment happens, a space where, where we are just kind of constantly discerning who we are to God and, and discovering it and living in this kind of meadow metaphor of, um, of following God's will. But at the same time, there, there are times where, where we need um, a little more of a dire direction, or maybe not we need, but maybe God wants us to give us a little bit more direction. So, so Warner talks about this being um, a second metaphor, or, or the bullseye metaphor. He, he says this, he says, The second image of God's will is a bullseye, a precise target, which may be hard to reconcile with the expanse of the meadow, but the meadow and the bullseye are not mutually exclusive. There are times when you're frolicking in the meadow without a care in the world, and you hear the shepherd saying that it's time to move to another area in the meadow, possibly one that is not as lush or as close to a water source. In times like these, the meadow is transformed into a bullseye, and your freedom to playfully move about is taken from you. As God makes God's bullseye will known, this new place, since it is in the meadow, still offers freedom and still a place to experience joy, but experiencing that joy may take time. For now, the spaciousness of the meadow may have been greatly reduced, and the ongoing invitation of freedom has been replaced by the... Ch now remember that this, this idea that the the guidance and the affirmation split from one another and and so there's a place that tells us to go and maybe it tells us to leave a scenario and go into another scenario a very specific direction it's a the freedom to obey or not or to move or not uh, but at the same time maybe even more important than the freedom to move or not is this sense that it all kind of relies upon our affirmation of who we are to god because as we discover who we are to god we discover that god loves us he has plans and purposes for us that we are we are important to him and then all of a sudden the idea of moving into a place that maybe we weren't expecting, maybe we aren't desiring, is still something that is worthwhile because, well, God says so. And so we trust him. And so we, so we kind of move in this place of, of bullseye where we kind of narrow our freedoms um, to, in response to God's invitation. And so in the truth of times where God will kind of interrupt our time in the meadow and say he wants us to do something specific. But the truth is, <laughs> there's a lot of times where we kind of need a bullseye kind of directional um, kind of input from God where we may, might be in a meadow and there's a time for decision and we need to know or want to know what is God's take on this relationship? What is God's take on this decision-making reality in my life? And so we get to this core question of discernment. How do we know what God is doing? How do we know when we're in the meadow? How do we know when God might be kind of giving us indication and maybe we're not hearing it? How do we, how do we hear these things? So the obvious answer to that is in our relationship with God, we, we can begin to recognize God's voice. So we know when he speaks. <laughs> and when he's not speaking, <laughs> that's because he's not speaking. Easy. Uh, discernment doesn't always work that way. And, and that is one of the reasons for the practices of discernment. You see, one of the key realities of the practice of discernment in re regard to vision and re regard to discernment or, or discernment of, of direction um, is this idea of orientation. Uh, orientation meaning which way are you facing? Are you away from God, facing God, then we're in relationship with God. It's easier for us to hear God. It's easier for to, just to discern kind of God's will upon our lives. And so a lot of the discernment practices are actually set up in order to kind of keep us oriented, orientated uh, toward God, oriented toward God. Um, and I want to teach you two disciplines that, uh, that do a good job of kind of reorienting this to God. Uh, in our class, we talked about this kind of fictitious example of, um, <laughs> of a board trying to discern what color to paint a room. Uh, and the truth is, you know, the easy answer to that, of that is well, we find the person with the best sense of color and we just tell them to go ahead and make the decision. Um, but if we're to kind of push our, our, our level of discernment to edges that maybe don't equal the, the task at hand, uh, the truth is that 
And what we actually ought to do in the beginning of such a conversation is first make sure that we are orientated toward God, that we're facing God, that we're not um, in any way, shape, or form facing something else. And so two prayers at the very outset of things are things that help us to kind of face God. And the first one is, is a prayer for wisdom. And you find that in your booklet on page 14. <laughs> And it comes to us from, from James chapter 1, verse 5, where, where Scripture tells us, uh, If any of you is lacking in wisdom, ask God, who gives to all generously and given to you. And so the idea is that um, we are not self-sufficient within ourselves, that, uh, that we are made wise by God, but at the same time there is wisdom from God that can be, be given to us, and all we need to do is ask for it. In order to ask, we need to acknowledge that we need it. And so the prayer of wisdom is very simple. Um, I actually try to pray this each morning as I get out of bed. It's to simply say, God, I, I, know, that my, um, I know that I don't have all the wisdom I need. I, I know that I need your wisdom spoken into my life. And if I have particular places, I'll name those places. But I essentially say, God, I need your help. I acknowledge that I don't have enough. I ask that you give me wisdom in this scenario and help me to see the things that you want me to see. Uh, it's a very simple prayer. Um, but the idea of it is just acknowledging that um, we have limitations that God is there for us, and we ask God to, to kind of come in and to take his place with us. Now, a second prayer, which is a little more difficult to understand, is the prayer for indifference. Now, we typically think of indifference as a negative thing, as if we don't care what's going around, around us, and, and maybe we check out and we're not paying attention. Uh, but the truth is, the prayer for indifference, the way that Ignatius of Loyola talked about it, um, didn't have to do with not paying attention to things in the world. It just talked about making sure that we were orientated toward God. Uh, the general idea is that um, that we are not indifferent in this world. There are a lot of things in our lives that kind of have a hold on us, that kind of tell us which way to go, which way not to go. Some of these things are kind of our, our desires, some of them are our proclivities, our opinions, some of them are, are places that we're wounded. In this fictitious idea of painting the room, if I at one point in my life had a dear friend who whose bedroom was painted red and he and I had a falling out or she and I had a falling out and so every time I thought of painting things red I only thought of the negative example of that person's in my life well then if the if God was leading us to paint that room red I would immediately have a negative reaction It'd be coming from a place of my woundedness or my past uh, another example when I was um, growing up I was a big New York Mets fan baseball and I paid attention to the Mets all the time. I'd listen to them before they, I went to sleep. I'd, keep, I'd read the box scores every single morning. And, and I soon realized at one point, um, at a very young age, that when I was watching the Mets or paying attention to the Mets, and if the Mets lost, I found myself to be in a bad mood. I was in a bad mood enough that it began to affect my, my attitude towards people, my attitude toward things around me. And, and at one point, I remember thinking, that's not good. I don't need to have my life <coughs> dictated by by the ways that a baseball team fares in, in, their, in the ways that they play. And so I remember at that point kind of deciding, I'm going to be a Mets fan, but I'm going to kind of dial it back a little bit. I want to be a little more indifferent to the way the Mets are. Um, there's a quote from a guy named Bob Pierce, who's the founder of World Vision, where he says this. He says, let my heart be broken by the things that break the heart of God. And that, is, in essence, is a prayer for ind of indifference. It's a prayer of recognizing there's a lot of things that break my heart. There's a lot of things that pull my heart. There's a lot of things that direct my heart. And I want my heart to be broken by the things that break God's heart. And so the prayer of indifference, um, again, is a prayer kind of, of orientation. It's a, it's a prayer of kind of at the beginnings, again, praying almost every morning or before you have a decision-making making opportunity. It's kind of saying, all right, God, I, I want indifference. I want to be indifferent to the things um, that are around me because I want to only care about the things that you care about. Break my heart for the things that break your heart. Make me passionate about the things you're passionate about. Help me to see clearly so I can understand and know where you are in the midst of this decision. So the prayer of, of, of indifference, it's found on page 13 in your, um, in your practices for discernment. Uh, it's very closely linked to confession. Because oftentimes a prayer of indifference will, will kind of begin to highlight within your own mind, within your heart, the things that do have a hold upon us. And, and the when we discover or discern the things that have a hold upon us, it's our job in some ways to begin to confess, to say, Jesus, he, here's the thing. I think the New York Mets have an undue influence in my life. They're affecting the way that I, I treat people. They're affecting the ways that I'm in relationship. And they're affecting my decision making in this process. So I confess that before you. I confess that as something that I don't want, that I want instead to be, um, to be led by you. And so, so we go through then into the prayer of confession, inviting God into that place of um, that we're confessing and asking him to bring us to wholeness and to, to bring us to peace. Again, the intention to bring us to a place of orientation, uh, to a place where we are, we are focusing on God in whatever scenario you're in. And so when we, we begin to, to look to God for discernment about direction or vision, uh, 
um, we're looking at God. So let me, um, let me make this a little more difficult. Uh, Ignatius of Loyola, who, who is um, kind of in many ways one of the forefathers of discernment, he would talk often about consolation and desolation. And what a consolation is are those times in life where in many ways we're, we're feeling the presence of God in a positive way. We feel joy, we feel hope, we feel, we feel full, fullness, we feel the peace of God. And he, and he contrasts that with desolation. And the sense of desolation is a sense of the absence of God or sometimes sadness or depression or kind of a, a negative feeling of, of downness. And so in many ways, when we're not hearing God specifically give us a bullseye of, <coughs> excuse me, of go, go this way or go that way, there are times where God gives us an idea of, of how he is leading us in a sense of trajectory by the consolations and the desolations within our lives. And so if there's a, I'll give you an illustration. When I was um, going to propose to my wife, um, I, was, I began to pray about it. And I began to ask God for kind of angels' voices or, or, or heavenly kind of something that would tell me this is the way, walk in it. Uh, but I didn't get it. And I, and I remember calling my little brother who had been married shortly before I was and saying, hey, did you get this experience? Because I did, haven't yet. Does that mean that I shouldn't marry Amy? And, and he kind of laughed at me and said, no, I, I had the same kind of experience. And I, I was seeking it and I didn't find it. And after praying some time, I got the sense that God wanted me to make a decision. And, and that God wanted me to own it. He wasn't going to, to make the decision for me. He wanted me to move in my free will. But at the same time, he gave me markers along the way where he began to show the ways that he affirmed my relationship with his relationship with his wife then. And he said, so it's more of a matter of, of not hearing God's voice directly, but, but seeking to find the ways that God's fingerprints are on the relationship all along. And so I did that. I remember hanging up the phone with him and spending time in prayer and, and having a sense of God's consolation in my relationship with Amy for over the last years of dating. And so much so that I became quite convinced that this is the way that God has led me. And I also came to a place of saying, I choose this. I'm going to walk in this way. Now, so orientation, um, consolation and desolation are, are, are ways that, that Ignatius of Loyola helps us to make decisions, maybe within the meadow, maybe to discern places where God might be leading us in kind of a more of a bullseye place. Um, but it kind of gives us a, a sense of um, the ability within our freedom, within our, our, our exercise of free will, to begin to discern the ways that God is leading us. Now, it gets a little tricky, though, because here's the thing about consolation and desolation. Consolation and desolation, or how we feel them, or what we react to, is often dependent upon what our orientation is. Let me see if I can explain that to you better. If we are focused toward God, we can trust that the things of consolation are the things that are leading us to God. Things of desolation are things are the places where we're being led away from God. If we are facing away from God, we can't be certain or maybe we can be certain that senses of consolation when we are facing away from God are actually things that are continuing to lead us away from God. And actually desolation when we are facing away from God can often be things that will lead us back to God. Uh, let me illustrate that. One of the things that I've often come across in counseling is, um, is couples who are having affairs. And, and I can't tell you the number of times I've, I've counseled the couple and uh, the person in, a, in the affair will say, Andrew, you don't understand. I, I can tell you how this feels. God is definitely in this. There's no way God would not be in this. And, and each time I kind of want to say, look, I, I know what you're saying. I know what you're feeling. But the truth of the matter is you're not facing the way that God wants you to be facing. You are not in a position to use consolation as a way of discerning if God is for you or not. Um, consolation, desolation. Uh, in many ways, our relationship with God is as real as any, any relationship we have with anybody else. And, and we get indicators of, of how that relationship is, and that's consolation, desolation. But, but it depends upon, in many ways, our, our, being face, our facing or being orientated toward God. And again, discernment practices like prayer of wisdom and the prayer of indifference help us to kind of face God. Uh, so let me give you one more discernment practice. Um, and this is a little more direct. Uh, if you are in a place where you are trying to discern something, uh, a decision you have to make or a relationship or, or a, a direction you need to go in, Ignatius of Loyola um, talks about having, having, um, using prayerful imagination in, in decision-making process, process. And he uses three different illustrations. I'll, I'll choose the one that I, that I find to be the most helpful. He'll basically say, if you're in a decision-making process, <laughs> what you need to do is pause. Pray, prayer of wisdom, prayer of indifference. Spend some time in silence. Spend some time in Lectio Divina. Spend some time to, to kind of orientate, orientate or orient yourself toward God. Um, and then in your mind, <coughs> make the decision. Make the decision in one way. If it's a black and white decision, then make the decision for black at this moment. And then sit in that for a while. Um, live in it. Uh, exist in it. Begin to discern um, 
What are you feeling? Begin to discern the, the consolations and the desolations. <laughs> begin, begin to discern um, what are the things that are kind of holding you back? What are the things that are kind of tripping you up? What are the, what are the struggles? What are the freedoms? What are the places of peace and awareness you have? And all of a sudden you begin to get a better sense of what that path would be like and how God walks with you on that path. And then once you've kind of done that, come back to center and kind of lay that decision down and pick up the other decision and live in that for a while. Make note of how that decision is affecting you. Make note of, of who, um, who you are in that decision. And, and after a while, when you come out of that, you, you will have a firmer sense of the ways that God is kind of walking with you down each of those paths and, and have a little clearer decision of, of where, where God is leading you. All right. I'm sorry, the wind blew everything away. Uh, that practice is on page 18 of your discernment booklet. So again, this, this, um, this session is, is kind of touching a little more deeply on uh, where the rubber hits the road as far as discernment goes and, and trying to make decisions. And, and as long as